In 1978, while I was still at school, Boney M released The Rivers of Babylon to a disco beat. It became one of the biggest selling singles of all time in the UK. It was many years later, as I read Psalm 137, that I realized with a jolt, I know these words. I had never known that they had been singing words from the Bible. And it was some time before I fully understood that this was a psalm of lament, of deep sorrow, a hymn expressing the anguish of the Jewish people in exile following the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem in 586 BC. Here then is Psalm 137 in its entirety. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth, if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem, how they said, Lay it bare, lay it bare, down to its foundations. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. This psalm is written by the exiles when they are in a really bad place. Of course, they were in a foreign land, a strange land, where they didn't know the language or the customs. They were far removed from all they cherished and all that gave them a sense of identity and security. With that geographic shift came a profound sadness and sense of loss. Their homes had been destroyed, their temple desecrated, and many would have seen their family and neighbours killed by the invading Babylonians. It's impossible to describe and hard to exaggerate the depth of grief and anger and even bitterness. A hidden irony in these words is that they speak of the children of Edom. The captives were Jews from the tribe of Judah. Judah was the eldest son of Jacob, who had tricked his older brother Esau, who was physically quite different, out of his inheritance. The Edomites were the descendants of Esau, which made them distant relatives, only adding to the pain of captivity. In researching this psalm, I looked again at the song by Boney M and discovered that it had been written in 1971 by the Melodians, a Rastafarian reggae group from Jamaica. They had discovered in this psalm a voice for their own grievance related to the enslaving of their ancestors in Africa by European nations such as Britain, France and Belgium. They saw Western civilization as Babylon and the cruelty and inhumanity of the slave traders as like that of the Babylonians of old. This psalm was for them then a cry for justice, showing that God's word remains relevant to every generation. While Jamaicans had their freedom in 1971, they still lived under the shadow of that period of exile and exploitation. Only now do I better understand that Psalm 137 is about slavery, describing the injustice of it and expressing the visceral anger in its final verses that can be felt by those who are violently stolen from their homes, trafficked and exploited, and who face ongoing discrimination because of their race or colour or religion. This psalm doesn't end well, with the writer calling for the destruction of the children of their captors. Sadly, man's inhumanity to man finds a place in every generation, and today other cultures are being exploited and their people enslaved and trafficked to the highest bidder. Perhaps they too could find that the words of this psalm resonate. How can we sing our songs in a strange land? Thankfully though, while the psalm ends on a sour note, 
the story of these captives does not end here. Over the coming years, they would discover that God had traveled with them on their hard road to Babylon. What's more, he had plans for them in this strange land, plans that would prosper them and not harm them, plans that would give them hope and a future. We know this because God had raised up a prophet in Jerusalem called Jeremiah, who had warned them many times that disaster was coming, but that God would be with them and would restore them. He told them of God's promise and plan. What's more, he gave them practical advice for how they would not just survive, but thrive in their new and unknown world. Jeremiah told them to build houses, to plant gardens, to marry and have children, and to seek the peace of the city. Because if it prospered, they too would prosper. What's more, they did learn to sing the Lord's song in a foreign land, and it gave them hope. One of the captives, the prophet Daniel, exemplified this as he served God rather than cursing his enemies and rose to the highest rank in government, which ultimately led to a reconciling of the two cultures. The world is currently reassessing its historic role in the transatlantic slave trade and how and by whom that history has been written. The toppling of the Bristol statue of slave trader Edwin Colston on the 7th of June this year was a seminal moment in that global self-awareness. No Western nation is unscarred by its legacy. Thank God that healing is possible by God's grace, that restitution can be made, God's promise to his people through Jeremiah 29 that he has a plan to prosper us and not to harm us, plans that would give us hope and a future, remains true today. Jeremiah's practical advice is also helpful. Find something to build. Find a way to grow. Pray for the city in which you live. This approach was so magnificently expressed on Capitol Hill in the speech of Martin Luther King, when he said, Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I have a dream that one day, sons of former slaves and sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. His speech that day ended with the words of a song he had learned to sing in a strange land. Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we're free at last. Human history is a work in progress. It is not yet finished. And Psalm 137 is not yet finished, but it will be as God's healing takes hold. It requires the grace of those who have been transgressed and the humility of the aggressor. But perhaps this psalm will finish with words similar to those we heard a few days ago in Psalm 133. How good and how pleasant it is when God's people dwell together in harmony. Let that be our prayer. Amen.